Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa, where we take difficult biological concepts and make them easy to understand. Here we are at the final video in our three-part series on metabolism. So far, we've explored how your body processes carbohydrates and fats to fuel movement, brain function, and overall energy demands. But what about proteins? While they're best known as the building blocks of muscles, enzymes, and hormones, proteins can also be broken down and used for energy when needed. When you eat protein-rich foods like meat, eggs, or beans, your digestive system breaks them down into amino acids, the fundamental units or monomers of proteins. This process begins in the stomach, where enzymes like pepsin start breaking down protein chains into smaller fragments. From there, the small intestine takes over using proteases to further digest proteins and absorb amino acids into the bloodstream. Once inside your cells, amino acids serve many purposes. They're used to build new proteins, synthesize important molecules, and when necessary, even generate ATP for energy. But how does your body decide when to use proteins for energy instead of their usual structural roles? And what happens to the nitrogen waste that's left behind when proteins are broken down? Join me as we break it all down in this video on protein metabolism. Once amino acids are digested and brought into the body through the bloodstream, they are then transported into the cells of the body through active transport by insulin-like growth factors and insulin. Almost immediately, they are reassembled into proteins. Unlike carbohydrates and fats, proteins cannot be stored for later use. This means that any excess amino acids must either be converted into glucose or fat, or their nitrogen component must be removed and excreted. But before amino acids can be oxidized, they must be converted to molecules that can enter into the Krebs cycle. This brings us to the first major step in protein metabolism, deamination. Before amino acids can be used for energy, their nitrogen-containing amino group must first be removed. This process, called deamination, takes place in the liver, where the amino group is stripped away, forming ammonia and a carbon skeleton. However, ammonia is toxic to the body, so the liver quickly converts it into a safer compound, urea, which is then filtered out by the kidneys and excreted in urine. This is why protein metabolism produces more waste than carbohydrate or fat metabolism. Once the nitrogen has been removed, the remaining carbon skeleton can enter energy metabolism through several pathways, depending on the type of amino acid. Some amino acids are converted into pyruvate, others into acetyl coenzyme A, and some feed directly into the Krebs cycle. This flexibility allows amino acids to be used for ATP production, but it comes at a cost. Breaking down proteins for energy leads to the loss of muscle and functional proteins. Because of this, your body prefers to use carbohydrates and fats for energy and only turns to protein as a fuel source in extreme conditions such as prolonged fasting, intense exercise, or malnutrition. One of the most important metabolic pathways involving amino acids is gluconeogenesis, the process of creating glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. When carbohydrates are scarce, the liver converts amino acids into glucose, ensuring that critical organs like the brain and red blood cells have a steady energy supply. This is why low-carb diets or prolonged fasting often lead to muscle breakdown. Your body taps into muscle proteins as a backup glucose source. Now that we've covered protein catabolism, let's talk a little bit about protein anabolism. Protein anabolism is the building of new proteins, and it is constantly occurring within the cells, primarily on ribosomes, where amino acids are linked together by peptide bonds to form functional proteins. Since proteins are a main component of cell structures, enzymes, and signaling molecules, 
adequate dietary protein is essential, particularly during periods of growth. Your body relies on 20 different amino acids to build proteins, but 10 of these are considered essential. This means that they must be obtained from the diet because the body cannot synthesize them in sufficient quantities. A complete protein found in foods like meat, dairy, and soy contains all essential amino acids in adequate amounts. In contrast, an incomplete protein, typically from plant sources like grains and legumes, lacks one or more essential amino acids. To meet your body's needs, incomplete proteins can be combined to form a complete protein profile, such as pairing rice and beans or peanut butter with whole wheat bread. What happens to excess amino acids when protein intake is higher than your body's needs? If these amino acids are not used for protein synthesis like we just talked about, or energy and protein catabolism, then their carbon skeletons can be converted into fatty acids and stored as triglycerides in adipose tissue. However, this is not the body's preferred route. Converting protein into fat is inefficient and rarely happens under normal dietary conditions. Protein metabolism is essential for growth, repair, and energy balance. While proteins are primarily used for building and maintaining tissues, they can also be converted into energy when necessary. However, relying too much on protein for energy comes at a cost, muscle loss and increased nitrogen waste. This is why a balanced diet with adequate carbohydrates and fats is crucial to ensure protein is used for what it does best, building and maintaining your body. If you found this breakdown helpful and you've enjoyed this three-part series on metabolism, don't forget to like, subscribe, and check out more of our content on human physiology. I'll see you in the next video.